It's not a cliche to say that uh, we're saturated these days by predominance of bad news, uh, whether it's war, natural disaster, or terrorism. And of course, it's, it's immediate. The technology these days means that we have a rolling update of this bad news uh, every day uh, for 24 hours. So everything that we see and hear seems to feel like it's bad. But whilst the immediacy and the connectivity of that bad news is a new thing, the phenomenon of the bad news isn't a new thing at all. When I was 12, I joined CND because of a daily fear of the dread of imminent nuclear war. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I was coming down a highway in Scotland with my girlfriend and her mother um, into Lockerbie as the, as the plane hit, uh, which was a deeply traumatic experience. I grew up with bomb scares and bombs. And like many of you, I've got friends and family that have been far too close to many recent events. So we'd be forgiven for feeling more and more depressed about the fact of all this bad news. So what I want to do today is actually to try and give you a little bit more of a positive, positive aspect, and maybe to ask whether, whether we're looking at that footage in quite the right way. So I want you, first and foremost, to come with me on a bit of a time machine to the end of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in spring 1991, um, I'm coming to the end of my first uh, teaching in my career in uh, Germany. And the East Germans have been given Grüßengeld, which is greeting money. It's about 100 marks of which they can come and experience the West. Ridiculous idea, like the West is some kind of sweet shop. And I'm on my way home, so I'm at Rhiner Station uh, near the Dutch border. I'm coming down into an underpass, and I encounter a man lying on the floor in a state of distress. He's bloody, he's got broken ribs, he's beaten up, and he's got no shoes. And a couple of station officials are trying to lift him off the ground to get him out of the underpass. And I, I ask them who he is. And they say he's an East German, which is amazing to me. And he'd been beaten up by West German youths uh, who resented the idea of reunification and the impact of that on their standard of living, possibly on their jobs. And so they're taking his trainers, because trainers, as we all know, are an absolute uh, symbol of Western consumerist power. And they also took his money. So I fished out of my pocket the last 100 marks that I had, um, because I'd budgeted for it, and I tried to press these upon him. Uh, and he wouldn't accept them at first. And we had a bit of a conversation, and then finally he did accept the money, and he embraced me. And I remember that time stood still in that moment, because what you've got to remember is that I'd never met anybody from the Soviet Union before. I'd grown up in the Cold War. My name is Piazetsky, but at that point it wasn't. My father had uh, anglicized his name as a young man, and so we went by a very English name, which was Maxted, and I knew no difference at that point. But as I sat on the train and then the ferry home, I felt bewildered. and I felt a kind of seismic shift in my sense of the other. And over the next 10 years, I began to realize that I didn't know whether my grandfather, who was a Polish airman, uh, had had any family at all, because he died in 1944. So I started to look for family. I started to research this. My father got on board. And first and foremost, we found veterans that had known my grandfather, which was amazing. Um, we had uh, Ministry of Defense searches for papers. I got the International Red Cross uh, onto a search for him as well. And around about 1997, they said that they discovered that my grandfather had a sister called Veronika Ogorodnik. That was her married name. And that she lived in Ukraine. But unfortunately, as the Soviet Union fell, so all the addresses changed, and they couldn't trace an address for her. And it came to 2000, and by this point, I was established as a performance artist, and I was lucky enough to be invited to um, the third international festival of experimental art in St. Petersburg, Russia, which was uh, a really big thing for me. It was really, a uh, really big deal. And whilst I was there, one of the things I did was I made a five-hour performance, which was called Underground at the Winter Palace. And it, it really dealt with my frustrations it was a collaboration with an artist, and it, it dealt with my frustrations at this severed family because of the Cold War. And afterwards, a Russian artist called Vladimir Yobukchuk uh, offered to help me uh, find the family, which I found 
really unlikely. Ukraine is a vast space, and it's got millions of people, but I thanked him. And two weeks later, he rang me up, and he said, Simon, excuse my accent, he said, uh, yes, my mother knows your grandfather's sister. And this was miraculous. But actually, it turned out to be true. So two months later, I took my father to Ukraine. And the family was reunited, as you see there, which was just an incredible moment. But at that point, what happened was a complete collapse of my sense of identity because I'd grown up in the Cold War. And suddenly, I was with family in Ukraine. And it wasn't that that collapse that I suffered in it in some way. Actually, it fascinated me, particularly as an artist. Um, and I started to explore it through different sorts of work. And pretty soon, that turned into a PhD project for me as well. Um, a PhD project that considered the shifts in our identity and the constructs of identity, which was antagonizing the idea of nationality, because I realized that my identity ran well beyond that, for example. And so, I was also interested in the journey because I realized that my grandfather had escaped from Poland on foot uh, through forests and over mountains at night. He'd been caught in Romania and put in a camp. He escaped. I don't think it was that well guarded. Um, he made it all the way to the Mediterranean and then via Marseille through France to Britain where he joined the RAF and was eventually killed uh, at the age of 25 in 1944. And so I began to really consider this idea of the journey. And I started to make theatre that took people across mountains at night, which sounds ludicrous, but that's what we did. And um, eventually I went to India because I wanted to speak to Tibetans in exile that had crossed the Himalaya, which seemed to me an unimaginable feat. Some of them only 12 years old when they did it. And then I took myself up the high Himalaya as well. Uh, and unfortunately, got struck down with uh, severe altitude sickness, um, a cerebral edema, which is a swelling of the brain. Well, I was brought into a valley, and I was dropped off at a dwelling, a farm, if you like, um, uh, with a family. And you have to lay on your back, really, for at least a week um, to deal with altitude sickness like this. And they fed me, and they washed my clothes, um, and they nursed me and they shared chang with me, which is a sort of barley beer. And it was the most amazingly compassionate experience of my life, um, uh, particularly in as much that there was no expectation of pay, although, obviously, I did give them something for their trouble. And this really uh, helped me to embody this notion of crossing a space in peril, something that really interests me. The PR in that, actually, etymologically, um, means to cross space. You'll find it in other words like experience or perform, which is what I'm doing now <laughs> with risk, um, or, uh, or experiment, for example. Um, it's also at the root of words uh, for the pilgrim, so, which comes from peregrine. So the PER means to cross a space. And there was a really interesting book by Francesco Carreri that I was reading at the time as well, which charted um, really a, a history of our uh, distrust of nomadic cultures which is um, a, another story, but still quite an interesting one. Recently, uh, my wife, Shelley, who's sitting there, and I have binge-watched The Walking Dead. Now, The Walking Dead, and here's a little bit of a spoiler for you, isn't really about zombies. Okay? The Walking Dead is about the complete loss of humanity at a time of, of, of this terrible sort of plague of zombies. It's about the loss of compassion, and it's about the loss of a sense of security. And it's also about an endless journey of a group of people to find something that, ironically, is already there within them. And I remember we got to series three, episode 12. At the beginning of this uh, episode, Rick Grimes and his son, Carl, are journeying along the highway, and they're off in search of um, some formula milk. They want to find some formula milk for Rick's baby. So they're driving along, and they see um, a, a chap on the side of the uh, highway with a rucksack and pots and pans, and he's desperately waving at them for help. He's on his own. He's desperately waving at them to slow down and help. And they slow down, and you think, oh, they're going to stop. But their faces are just expressionless. And just as he walks towards the car, they accelerate away and leave him. 
And then at the end of the episode, they're returning and they've found their formula milk in some abandoned town. And they come upon his half-eaten corpse. And they stop the car and they get out and they retrieve his rucksack, throw it in the boot, and off they drive again. And again, not a word is spoken. And at this point, we realize that there's absolutely no future for humanity because they've lost all sense of compassion. So it isn't about infrastructure. It's about the loss of compassion and the will to trust or help one another. As a theatre practitioner, um, I've always been uh, fascinated by the life and work of Antonin Artaud. And he wrote um, a bizarre and wonderful book called The Theatre and Its Double, um, which you shouldn't try to read unless you've already read a biography of him, because it is quite a bizarre read otherwise. But in this book, he suggests that theatre and the play are the only two spaces where we have the possibility of seeing human beings as they really are, stripped, that is, of things like national identity, rank, or professional role. It's actually at a time of the plague, for example, and I don't think he's been negative. I think it's at a time of the plague, for example, that we'll see the best in people. We have seen that in recent years in Africa. Um, but we've also seen it with uh, atrocities um, in our own lifetime, such as 9-11. Uh, so in 9-11, um, people were covered in this terrible white dust. And the white dust, in a sense, homogenizes what we see. So it's much harder to kind of see uh, any symbol of affluence or rank or professional role or even race. But what we do see is that people help one another. And not just the services who are fantastic, but people are helping one another. They're carrying each other, they're lifting one another, they're helping each other. And they're putting their own lives at risk because that white dust, actually, the inhalation of it, has killed more people since 9-11 than actually died on the day. I don't know if you're aware of that. More recently, in some of the footage of other uh, terrible situations, we've seen similar things. If I take you back, um, and I'm sorry to do so, but to Bataclan, you remember the terrifying image of a young woman hanging by her fingertips from a window. And a man called Sebastian puts his own life at risk to pull her back in, and she was pregnant. Um, other people break cover, and they come out to drag people clear, putting, again, their own lives at risk. And this really interests um, me. Now, um, I want to introduce you to a couple of authors. Uh, the first one is Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who wrote, as you might know, uh, Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince, which is my favorite book as a child. But he was a pioneering pilot, and he flew postal services over the Andes and over the Sahara, and he wrote a lot of books, quite philosophical, actually, about these journeys. And when the Second World War came about, um, he wanted to join up, much against the wishes of his publisher in New York and his government, who felt that his sword, his, his pen was much mightier than his sword. But he did join up, and he joined the Free French Air Force, and he became a reconnaissance pilot, um, flying uh, in towards the, invasion, the invading forces uh, to get information. Now, uh, recently, um, I adapted this book for theatre, and it was directed by uh, Shelley, and we've shown it in Armenia and in France, and we've shown it in Britain as well. And the reason it interests me is this. Flight to Arras is about one flight that he takes um, towards Arras, and um, the Blitzkrieg has hit Arras, so Arras is on fire. The tanks are rolling. Um, the anti-aircraft guns are firing into the air. It's just, he's just flying into hell. And as he's flying along, he's thinking, He's almost bound to die. So what is it that he's going to die for? He's trying to figure out what is it that's worth dying for. And he looks down from his aircraft above France, and he sees houses on fire below him. And he imagines the linen burning in the closets. He imagines the photographs, the family histories disappearing. He looks down at the roads, and the roads are absolutely teeming with refugees. Now, this is France. This is only 70 or so years ago. The roads are teeming with the French with, as refugees, and they're heading south. And he knows that they're just going to be transformed into vermin and locusts as they sweep through villages, eating all the food available, so the villagers just join the exodus. And in all of that, Santique Supri completely loses sight of his belief in God, for example. He can't see a future 
for France. He can't see a future for Europe, and he can't see any future for civilization. So what on earth is it that he's going to die for? What is worth dying for? I'll come back to him. First, I want you to take, to take you to um, Adam Smith. had a great nose. <laughs> and Adam Smith, of course, wrote the, um, the Wealth of Nations, which is a sort of bedrock or cornerstone of uh, capitalist consumerist culture. We think of it as, you know, in, with such terms as dog-eat-dog -dog world and this sort of thing. But he also wrote another book, which um, he's far, um, he was far more proud of, actually. And he returned to, he was so proud of this book, he returned to it at the end of his life and did another edition in 1790. And this book was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's extraordinary and quite ironic when you think about its relationship to the wealth of nations, because he says in this book, that human beings are essentially altruistic in nature, that they want to help each other, actually. That we have this automatic, inbuilt instinct to help, even for no personal gain. And the book starts like this. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Please remember it was 1790, and things were a little bit male-gendered in the, the language of these things at that point. So it's he all the way through it, but he means us. Um, and he refers to this quality of wanting to help each other as loveliness, which is quite a soft word by today's standard. But loveliness, he talks about the choice for right action, not born of a need to please so much as a wish to serve with prudence, justice, and beneficence. So if I translate that, we might say that it's care for oneself. Uh, care for fairness or justice, if you like, to oneself and others, and generosity of spirit to others. You're all aware of these values. And I find that extraordinary because I think there's a huge amount of truth in it, actually. So he's written this book alongside The Wealth of Nations. But he gives us a problem. And to illustrate this problem, I'm going to ask you a question. I need to see a raise, uh, you to raise your hands. If there was, goodness forbid, Let's say a, a disaster near here. Let's just say a river has burst its banks, and two miles away from, well, let's say it's from where you live, a river has burst its banks, and two miles away, a village has been flooded. I want to see a raise, uh, you to raise your hands. Do you think that you would go two miles, wade in the water, and help people out if it was that local, if it was two miles? To see, could people raise their hands? Quite a lot of you. There's a few people going, I don't know, it might be cold. <laughs> Two miles, yeah, I think you would. I think, generally speaking, if it was that close to you, you would. How about if it was the next town, 10 miles away? Could you raise your hands again? Lovely, some honesty in the room. So, it's a maybe. <laughs> 10 miles away, and we're already saying, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. 30 miles away, then. So it's across the county now. <laughs> There's one person saying, I think I would. Um, generally speaking, though, it's a no, isn't it? So 100 miles away, forget it. <laughs> unless, it unless it's a close member of a family or friends. And 1,000 miles away, I'm upset about it. I am. I'm worried. It's really not my problem. Yes. <laughs> okay. And that's how we are. So Pris Smith's problem is locality. Because he says, yeah, you know, we are all altruistic in nature. We will lift people off the street. They fall over in front of us. It doesn't matter who they are. But this is really localized because instinctively, it's also about self-preservation. If we sort of help our tribe, our immediate tribe, then in a sense, we're creating more security for ourselves. So this is the instinct. But this is my idea. I think that given the immediacy of this technology that connects us globally to the world, we really need to work harder to rewire ourselves to think about what local means. We need to make these events far more local because of the immediacy of our technology, and we need actually to help out in all the ways that we possibly can. We will feel good about that. But in order to do that, we also have to change the notion of what we belong to. And we have to flip it around because we've got to get rid of the divisiveness of belonging because the flip side of belonging is exclusion. 
So if I were to give you an example, if I go to a festival, like a bit of rock, if I go to the Download Festival or something like that, okay, and I'm there, I'm there amongst lots of different age groups, loads of different races, lots of different religions, lots of different ranks and professional roles, but somehow we're there together and we all have a sense of belonging in a celebratory, rather lovely way together. And so we also need to redefine what it is we belong to in those very positive aspects. And I'm going to finish with telling you what Saint Exupéry did die for, because he was eventually shot down in 1944, exactly the same time as my grandfather, who flew a Wellington bomber that was built in Chester. And what was it that he would die for? Well, at the end of flight to Arras, he sort of lands, and he's walking along the country lane back to the little farming family that he's billeted with, a lovely family. And he suddenly has a bit of an epiphany. And he realizes that he wouldn't die for that family. He wouldn't die for the refugees that he saw on the road, all those uh, hundreds of feet below the aircraft. He wouldn't die even for the victims of war. What he would die for is the people that would help them. He would die for the person that would give up their seat in the back of a truck for a pregnant woman. He would die for the person that would carry someone else on their back. He would die for the person that put their own self at risk to get someone out of danger. And he would die for the person that pulled someone else from underneath the rubble. And at this point, Saint Exupéry refines his idea of God. And he looks out and he can see the fields of France again. And he can see a future for Europe. And he can see a future for civilization. Because he knows that people are predominantly good. Thank you very much.